time to go squatching. Welcome, everybody, to the latest episode of World Bigfoot Radio. We decided that uh, because of the uh, request for it, uh, rather than have a guest on today, that we would actually just talk about um, what people have been asking about, and uh, to wit, the uh, questions keep coming up over and over again about a Wendigo and Genosqua and Gugwe and what are they. And um, I've actually done a show on this already, but it was on Sasquatch Chronicles and it was a members only um, episode. So I felt like for the benefit of the people that aren't members on there and, and haven't heard anything about this, that I would do sort of a another iteration, a reiteration of the show and uh, add in a few more um, accounts that we didn't touch on during that program so that people that did hear the, the previous one will have something new to listen to on this one. And since I'm basically going to be the guy that's going to be uh, explaining all of this, um, I'm not going to interview myself. So my uh, faithful and superb mad scientist, uh, henchman and guest host, um, Grant Brunetta, will be taking over and doing my job and uh, asking questions on your behalf so that hopefully we can catch everybody up to speed about what these other sub-variety mystery hominids are. And when you guys uh, get done listening to the show, hopefully maybe if you uh, see a, a report with one of these tip-offs in it that you'll be able to go, aha, that's not a Bigfoot, that's actually a fill-in-the-blank. And without further ado, here's your uh, guest, uh, excuse me, my co-host and your actual host for the rest of the show, Grant Burnett. Hey, guys. Was there a certain uh, subspecies you wanted to start off with, Duke? Or, um, well, I don't know if I really want to go over the whole thing again because it takes a little while, but um, as a bunch of you know, and if you don't, there is a video up that you can go find on it. It's called Wendigo Encounter. I talk about the first encounter that I had with a mystery hominid type creature was when I was 10 years old. I was out sledding and I uh, had one trying to sneak up uh, from behind me, peeking at me uh, through the branches of a pine tree. And uh, I managed to get out of there alive. Just sheer circumstances happened to be at the very top of uh, an incredibly steep triple hill uh, <clears throat> with a sled. <laughs> and so I made the best use of it. But uh, that's what set me on the uh, course of being interested in Bigfoot and really wanting to find out more about it, what uh, what its habits were, what it was. And the thing that I saw was so different from what was perceived to be Bigfoot at the time. This was 1972, and at that time, there were just few, if any, books or anything like that, the subject that were out there. And uh, the only really decent uh, pictures or video that anybody had taken was what's still holding up to this day, the 1967 uh, Roger Patterson, Bob Gimlin footage of what they're calling Patty. And uh, so after I saw mine, I, I, of course, saw the video of Patty again, watched it a lot more intently, and went, well, that just doesn't look anything like what I saw. What the hell? So then I wasn't convinced that I had even seen Bigfoot for a long time. I didn't know what it was. And I did a lot more research and realized that maybe I was looking in the wrong place and I should do research on the area around where I was living instead of in the Pacific Northwest where I was not living. And uh, maybe the local natives knew something about the critter that I saw, and maybe it wasn't even a Bigfoot. Well, it turns out, make a long story short, it was a Bigfoot. It's what I believe nowadays to be a sub-variety of Bigfoot. And it's what the uh, the natives in the uh, upper east and central part of the country uh, will refer to as a Wendigo. And so that's what took me so long to to figure out the difference and also what made me knowledgeable about the whole thing, because I had to sort of approach this thing rather than going through the wide front door. Welcome. I'm Bigfoot. I am going to be your host and I will be scaring the crap out of you tonight. I was like sneaking in through the alleyway and almost getting mugged by the Wendigo bouncer off and back and uh, barely making it in. So <clears throat> it was a little bit different uh, story for the way <clears throat> I went about things. And because of the encounter that I had, I had sort of a different perspective on it and, I knew right away that either that what I saw wasn't a Bigfoot or there was more than one kind of Bigfoot. And the more I looked at these reports and stuff, I realized that there were more than one kind. In fact, there were several sub-varieties 
depending on what part of the country or the continent you're on. And so that's how I got interested in the whole question to start with from my, my own first encounter and just from knowing that it didn't look like Patty or even, you know, variation being too wide for it to actually be a member of the same um, genetic group, I guess. What were the um, physical differences that you noticed um, from looking at the, you know, the Patty footage to what you saw? Right. Well, in the Patty footage, you can't see um, the face that well. It turns and looks at the camera toward, well, actually past the camera. He was looking at Bob as he was riding his horse across the river, pulling his rifle out of his uh, saddle holster to cover Roger as Roger was trying to run closer and stabilize the camera and get video. But you can't see her teeth or anything, so you don't know what the inside of her mouth looks like. But uh, you can see her hands and whatnot. And there's uh, just no hint of her hands being anything different looking than what a normal apes or human's hands are. The thing that I saw that was peeking between the two branches was holding uh, the one branch up with its upper hand and the other one down with its lower hand. I was about 40 feet away, so I could see the end of its fingertips on both hands. And they had claws on them. And when I, when I was younger, I used to actually describe them as talons because that's more what they reminded me like rather than claws. It just looked like it had talons on its fingertips. Then when it opened its mouth, um, as I found uh, a lot later on from reports from eyewitnesses that had seen other varieties up close, um, the uh, regular southern wood ape, uh, wood booger, and the, the type 2 seem to have a construction of their dentition is uh, more similar along the lines of like a gorilla or something where you've got your uh, incisors, bicuspids, molars, um, standard arsenal, um, and then their canine uh, fangs are a little bit bigger. Um, but other than that, you know, it's it's omnivorous type mouth. It's mostly made for plant eating. Um, the Wendigo that I saw had huge fangs, upper and lower, and the rest of its teeth all looked like they were designed for eating meat too. Even the uh, um, incisors in front were like angled, like they were it's hard to describe kind of like a bear trap arrangement or something where they would, they would meet together and slice. But, um, I mean, that's just my impression of it. That was 40 years ago. I was a little kid. I didn't have more than about a second and a half to study its face before I dove on my sled and tried to set the world's luge record going downhill and getting away. But anyway, when I started finding reports about when to go, all these reports, uh, where there was anybody that had, seen the thing's uh, face or hands or anything like that. They always, the, the reports and the legends talked about them having large uh, upper and lower canines and claws on their fingers and toes. And so that's when I started going, aha, wait a minute. This, this isn't the same thing as Patty, but it is some kind of a Bigfoot-like monster that lives out in the woods. So then I started doing a lot of research on the Wendigo specifically and uh, that was not just one can of worms, but three cans of different uh, types of worms, trying to figure that one out. So my next question is, um, I know that you mentioned, you know, you lived in Minnesota, and that's where you saw the Wendigo. Regionally, where do the reports come from, mainly? Uh, well, they started <clears throat> coming in as the first colonists started landing over on the coast. Uh, most of them were coming in from the French fur trappers originally. Then they started coming in from the lumbermen, the loggers. Uh, a lot of these were from uh, uh, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, Maine, Upper New York, um, Ontario, you know, um, uh, northern forests mostly. Although the Indians in the south, uh, southern, southeastern part of the country also had legends about a creature that was similar to this that they called uh, the Genosqua. Let's just let me give you an example here. Um, I know that there's over a dozen regional subvarieties of deer here in the lower 48. So if we accept that Bigfoot's a reality, expecting one from Maine to be the same as one from Oregon, Texas, or Florida is probably a pretty foolish idea. It also seems that there's regional variants existing in the same area with each other and other, like I'm saying, other varieties nearby them. So if these populations of different types were inbreeding between them, the sub-varieties, you would think, in the local populations would have long ago stabilized into one homogenous blend. 
but from the reports we're seeing, um, it seems to be that the opposite is true. Um, so sort of like an area where you may have uh, white-tailed, black-tailed, tail, mule deer, elk, and moose all in the same area. And no, they're not inbreeding with each other. And um, also, just to get it out of the way right from the get-go, I don't think that the dogman, wolfman thing is um, a variety of Bigfoot or related to Bigfoot in any way. Although the type three dogman actually is a Bigfoot and is erroneously lumped into the category with dogman. So getting back again to what I was talking about before, um, when I heard about the Patterson Gimlin film, I, I thought to myself, well, great. Someone's got a video of the thing I saw. And then of course I looked at it and the hair was too short and it was the wrong color and the, the face was different. It didn't have claws on its fingers. Body shape was wrong. And it was a different gender. But other than those tiny discrepancies, exact match. Well, just all kidding aside, um, obviously after I saw that, rather than feeling validated by the film, I was more confused about it than ever. And uh, I knew that these things were real, so I knew Native people, if they were real, must have known something about them, which is why I started doing this research and finding out about the Wendigos and then getting descriptions on them. And the whole thing gets really confused um, because there are old news articles of these things going back, you know, all the way into the 17 and 1800s. Um, but they're usually discounted as escaped gorillas, mountain giants, yahoos, wild men. Of course, they never used the word Bigfoot. They didn't have that word until the 1950s. So sometimes it's sort of difficult to know what they're talking about. But when you get to... Like regular names, for example, okay, if it, if these things were real, then the natives would have known about them, right? That just makes sense. So if the natives knew about them, then that means they must have had names for them, right? So theoretically, if these things were Bigfoot, they would only have one name for Bigfoot. But if they weren't Bigfoot, they would have a name for this and Bigfoot. So I figured, okay, well, then the tribes on the East Coast just call... Bigfoot Wendigo, right? That's all it is. And as I did more research, I found out that might not be right either. Um, because nearly every tribe has a name for Bigfoot. Many of them, of course, have rather unpleasant meanings. But some of these tribes have two or more names for Bigfoot as well. Now, why would you have more than two names for the same thing? That just doesn't make sense. What other... Uh, you know, groups of people or tribes or civilizations give the same animal multiple names. Um, you know, I mean, unless it's something you domesticated and you're making like breeding sub varieties or something, what, why would you do that? So, but even if you eliminate the gender specific names, like a wild man or a wild woman examples, um, there's still at least 22 of the 32 tribes known to me, which have multiple names for them. And it seems redundant, at least at first, but then when you begin to look at how the names translate, they start standing out into certain groups according to their meanings, and the names seem to begin to convey different behaviors, and I believe independent sub-varieties of Bigfoot-type creature being seen and described. Um, and like I was saying, we can't cherry-pick this information and, and remain objective and go, on the one hand, oh, the natives knew about Bigfoot. Look, they have all these names for it. And then on the other hand, go, well, there's only one type, though, even though they've got multiple names, they're just talking about the same creature, right? Uh, I don't think so. Now, if you go north where you're at, Grant, up there um, into the northern Ojibwa lands, I know they've got four names for their local cryptid hominids. They've got the a uh, uh, name for the mountain giant. They've got a name for... The Gugwi, which they call a Tugwi. They've got the uh, um, the name for Bigfoot is Makwanina. And the name for the Wendigo is Wendigo. Um, the name for, for Mountain Giant is Masabi. So there you go. There's four names right there. So um, in the region between the western end of the Great Lakes and the east coast and extended north into the Arctic, the stories of a Bigfoot-like creature with a very disturbing and violent side to them are plentiful and obvious. Clearly, the range of this creature could have extended as far south as eastern Oklahoma in, you know, past historical times. 
and it may still exist in mountainous regions to the north of there to this day. Psychology has a term drawn from this in the legends of the Cree Indians, which has been called the Wendigo psychosis, a clinical term denoting cannibalism brought on by long-term isolation, usually cabin fever type stuff, in which the crazed person eats other people nearby, even if food is available. Um, but this, however, is not what the natives are actually describing. If you go back in time, what you find out is the further and further and further you go back, the less it has the actual description of a phantom of the forest, and the more it's described the attributes of a phantom of the forest. So what I'm saying is they thought of it as a real being that had abilities that were beyond the normal just because it was so capable. And when the superstitious fur trappers and uh, lumbermen moved into the area and heard the stories from the natives, they added their own layer of supernatural dressing on top of it. And then the next group that came along added their layer on top of it. And the whole thing started getting very confused. And the natives may have been doing this to a certain extent, too. If um, these giant uh, man-eating hominids were around the area and one of the braves went crazy and started eating other um, Indians, maybe they said to themselves, hey, he's you know possessed by the Wendigo because he's eating us like the Wendigo would do. Maybe that's where the idea of Wendigo possession came from. Maybe that's where the whole idea for the Wendigo psychosis came from, that they were seeing this behavior being exhibited by other humans, and rather than saying that they were Wendigos, they were saying that they were acting like a Wendigo, and then this got misconstrued later on, and it became them being possessed by the spirit of of the Wendigo. I kind of wanted to touch on the, because um, you've done a lot of uh, looking into um, the Gugwe species as well, which has more of a um, a muzzle, and that's why it gets categorized as dog man. That, that one gets miscategorized as a type 3 dog man, and that's exactly why, because it's got a muzzle on it. And when people think of it, they, they or see it, they think of something that's canine, um, because, you know, that's what they usually see that's got a muzzle on it. If they lived in Africa, they might think it was a baboon, um, because baboons have muzzles too. And um, some of the reports from the natives and the old timers that were seeing this a long time ago pretty much bear that out. As soon as they found out what a baboon looked like and saw a picture of one, the ones that had seen a gugwe went, hey, that's what it looks like. It looks like a baboon. Um, so... That's where the whole description of that thing came from. Before I get into that, Grant, would you mind if I went over some of the the names here for a minute, just to uh, to give people a little bit better rundown on on the names for some of these things over there? Well, I, I mentioned that the original name Wendigo got corrupted and used as a term for a clinical um, cannibalism psychosis, the Wendigo psychosis. Now, the name that the Cree actually called the, the creature the Wetico. And that's where we first get the uh, the name Wendigo from. The Tet du Boulay call it the Wittico, and the Eastern Athabascan call it Windago, which means wicked cannibal. Um, the whole area, all of the tribes have a belief in a very dangerous humanoid creature with what we would consider to be revolting habits, inhabiting the forests of the Northeast. The Algonquin linguistic group alone, from the East, the Upper Midwest, and Lower Canada, uses the following names, Wendigo, Wendigo, Wetico, Wetico, Wittico, and Wendigoag, which is plural, and even more other similar sounding names to describe these wicked cannibal giants. Now, as if that wasn't compelling enough that you've got all of these tribes in this one confederation that all have variations on the same name from the same critter, um, there are other ones along the way, too. The uh, Chinu is another name for them. Um, the Strendu is yet another name for them. Um, the Canadian description of this being being a half phantom, half beast who lives in the forest and preys on human beings, and particularly children. Um, the belief in this horror dates back to the earliest Indian legends, and so it's not recent. It wasn't created by the white man. It said the Wendigo will eat the flesh of its victims. Um, one account from the 1800s in the area of the Ojibwe, um, as I was just mentioning them a little bit ago here, tells us of the Muskegos, 
who inhabited the low and cheerless swamps on the borders of Hudson's Bay, who were reproached by other tribes and were said to be cannibals. But they themselves, the Muskegos, claimed that it was those others that live in the bush nearby that they were in constant fear of, the Wendigo. According to the Reverend Joseph Guinard in his article, Whittico Among the Tete de Belay, the Whittico wore no clothes. Summer and winter, he went naked, never suffered from cold. The skin was black like that of a Negro. He would rub himself like the animals against fir, spruce, and other resinous trees. When he was thus covered with gum or resin, or sap, or pitch, he would go and roll in the sand and rock so that one would have thought, after many operations of this kind, he was made of stone. The voice of the Whittico is said to be strident and fearful, fearful and more reverberating than thunder. He is a huge individual who goes naked in the bush and eats Indians. Now, similar behavior and applique armor installation are also ascribed to the Pasmaquoddy Chinu, like I mentioned before, who they said would rub themselves all over with fur balsam and then roll themselves in the ground so everything would adhere to the body. This same habit is ascribed to the Iroquois stone coats, the bloodthirsty cannibal giants who they claimed also used to cover their bodies with pitch and then roll around in the sand and down sandbanks. And also, according to John Cooper in the Cree Whittico psychosis, the Chinu of the Micmac, Whittico of the Cree, and Stone Coast of the Iroquois all seem to be a description of the same horror. So the Strendu um, were, let's see, the Huron and Wyandot around Lake Huron, um, they described the Strendu as uh, having extraordinary size and powers. Some descriptions have these beings half as tall as a tree and equally large in proportion. Bodies covered all over in flinty scales, which made them almost invulnerable. According to Hartley Burr Alexander in Mythology of All Races, the Iroquois and Stone Giants of New York, as well as similar beings among the Algonquins, belong to a widespread group of mythic beings, eh, of which the Eskimo Tornet is another example. Huge in stature, unacquainted with the bow, and employing stones and logs for weapons. In awesome combat, they fight one another, uprooting the tallest trees for weapons and rending the earth in fury. Commonly, they are depicted as cannibals. Of course, if there is any historical element to these myths, it is colored and overlaid by wholly mythic concepts of stone-armored titans and demiurges. Now, the other term for the Iroquois stone giants, which you folks may have heard from, comes from the Seneca, and it is Ginosqua. Or Genosqua. So, at this point, if you ask, the, is the question, is the Wendigo and the Genosqua the same thing? The answer is yes, they are. I just use the, the term for Wendigo to mainly describe things around the uh, Canadian border and, and north of there, and uh, Genosqua for anything that sounds like the same kind of creature from south of there. So, in the future, to avoid any confusion, just keep that in mind. If I, if I say uh, Genosqua or Wendigo, it's the same creature. The only difference in the appellation will, will be um, solely dependent on location. So the other one you wanted to know about was the Gugwe. Well, in the forest of Maine, the Penobscot tell the Kawakawi, again, a giant cannibal monster. And also the Micmac mentioned the dreaded Gugwe. And some regions had something perhaps worse than the Wendigo, and this may have been it. A cannibal monster with big hands and a face like a bear's, according to Elsie Clues Parsons in Journal of American Folklore, 1925. When the question arises, does a face like a bear's allude to a hairy face or having a snout like a bear? Well, in the book The Micmac Indians in Eastern, Eastern Canada, Ruth Sawtell Wallace and Wilson D. Wallace mention that Gugwees is a grotesque creature. In the turn of the century period, he was commonly compared to a baboon. By the 1950s, more emphasis was being put on the description of him as a giant. So for this, this just says to me, uh, baboon snout on giant body. Um, the Gugwe, I believe, is the name of the baboon face subvariety of Bigfoot that people run into occasionally. Um, and this, so I've been re researching them as similar to the Wendigo, but different from the 
because they did exist in the same area that Wendigo legends came out of. And clearly the native tribes there thought of them as two different types of creatures. Um, also, the uh, uh, Gugwe may have gone from its territory on the coast and presumably northward. Um, I still keep hearing reports from upper and central Canada that uh, the bear man, which is what they call it up there, is alive and well running around and being spotted up there. But you don't hear reports of anybody seeing them down here in the lower 48 very often. And I think, you know, for two reasons. First of all, they probably like having less humans around than a couple of the other sub varieties will put up with and um, like a bigger range. And the other one might may be that they're more adapted to cold like the Wendigo are and just don't like being too far south where it's too warm. Although they don't have a description of having really long hair or fur on them. It's usually a description of shorter, shorter type uh, hair and fur. So I'm just guessing on this one based solely on where the sightings are happening and that as you go further north, there tends to be a, a more of them. Yeah, so it kind of sounds like um, all these subspecies that we're kind of going through are are a lot more um, aggressive than your typical paddy type Bigfoot. Yeah, and the natives that had them in their in their areas also usually have mention of the fact that these things don't get along with each other either. The regular type 1s and type 2s do not get along with the Wendigo. Um, nobody gets along with the Gugwe. Um, if these things try and move into areas where there's already um, troops of regular Bigfoot living, the chances are that they're going to be getting themselves into a fight and probably getting chased back out of that area again. So they just, you know, if they get displaced from where they're at, they may not have much option other than to try and go out into the middle of nowhere or just keep heading further north where there's less and less humans, assuming they can figure that out. You know, I, I just don't know about that. But it does seem that when they're spotted, they're generally further out in the middle of nowhere, where you'll have type 1s and type 2s hanging around fairly close to civilization in some cases, because they're sort of doing the the uh, same job as a bear. They're an omnivore, and they're um, an opportunist, and, and occasionally an ambush predator. And they just do the night shift more, and the bears do the day shift. So where you would expect that maybe bears would raid your garbage can or something on the outskirts of town, well, you can pretty much expect Bigfoot to do the same damn thing. If they're living around the area, it's an easy-to-get-at food source, and there's not you know, a whole lot of anything else available, it then becomes worth it for them to go raid your trash can. So you know, you hear about this kind of stuff from ones and twos, but you almost never hear about it from a Wendigo or a Gugwe. If it's anything along those lines, it's that they're actually breaking into the house, and usually when people aren't there, and trying to steal all the food in the house. They're not picking through the garbage can occasionally. Uh, they just tear the damn place open and ransack it. Come on in. Yeah, you got to wonder, uh, some of these reports of the old fur trappers and stuff up north would come back in their cabin and just be destroyed and, uh, you know, They'd find big bear looking tracks that coming out of the cabin and stuff and and wonder what what's the bear doing awake in the middle of the winter, breaking into their cabin eating their food. Yeah, bear are awake in the winter. Uh yeah, generally that's that's the way you think of it. So again, that's uh it's just one of those weird things about these guys. I think these these two sub varieties are a lot more uncommon than the types type ones and type twos are and i'm going mainly just by the number of reports that you get of them you know uh from for every 10 bigfoot reports there's maybe one report of either one of these types so it just seems that either they're they're way further out in the middle of nowhere we're not running into them as much or there just aren't as many of them around and maybe both all right duke um could you kind of cover some of the um, physical attributes, uh, what to look for when you're out in the woods, if you see one of these, um, what they're uh, like a physical description? Sure. Uh, from uh, what I've been able to gather, the easiest way to tell a gugwe from a wendigo is just to look at its face. If it's got a snout, it's a gugwe. If the face is flatter, it's a wendigo. Um, how to tell 
a gugwi from a dogman, which they get confused with because, again, the gugwi has a snout. If you're looking at just the upper part of their body and you can't see the lower part of their body, um, if it's got long pointy ears sticking off the top of its head and a longer, more attenuate snout, so basically describing like a head like a German shepherd or a wolf, it's probably a dogman. If it's got ears on the side of its head, like an ape or a baboon or something like that, and they're not that big, then you're probably looking at a gugwi. If you can see the rest of its body, a gugwi has a body like a Bigfoot for the most part. Um, a dog man has a body just like a, a wolf if it was standing up on its hind legs, a little bit more massive. Um, but they have front um, arms and hands that look sort of humanish with claws on them. So just seeing the front arms and hands of some one of these creatures sticking out through the wood, uh, in between branches on a tree or something, you really wouldn't know what you were looking at. You wouldn't know if it was a dog man, Wendigo, or uh, the bear man, the gugwi, because they all have claws. Um, and the gugwi and the Wendigo also have claws on their feet. I think like these guys are more equipped for um, just being straight predators with their with their teeth and their claws. Uh, would you say mainly that's their their main diet would be hunting, uh, eating meat? Uh, yeah, I would bet that the Wendigo or the Gugwe could actually eat plant material if it was interesting, you know, a food source that was worth eating. Um, they probably can eat it. But again, the further north that you go, the more you're into an area that unless you're a huge uh, ungulant and you've got uh, two or four stomachs to digest, some of this hard fibrous plant material, there's really nothing that you can eat to make a living off of for most of the year. Um, you know, you got seven, eight months of winter every year. You better be able to eat meat because, you know, otherwise you're going to starve to death. So that's why I tend to lead, lean toward these things eating a larger um, percentage of their diet in um, uh, meat, you know, the raw protein source. And the other thing, of course, is with, um, large meat eaters in areas like this, um, they tend to get bigger than the ones that you'll find in southern areas. The more mass they have in relation to what their actual um, surface area of their body is, the more they can hold heat in and stay warmer. So um, it makes more sense for them to be uh, thinner and uh, lighter build down in the south and thicker and heavier up in the north where they're going to spend more of the year in really cold temperatures. And another thing that gets mentioned in all the reports on these critters is that they just seem to be indifferent to conditions of temperature. Um, some of the Indian legends have the uh, when to go out actually hunting during blizzards and uh, using the, the sound of the wind hauling the blizzards to cover their own howls and whistles back and forth to each other that they're using to coordinate their attacks on whatever it is they're sneaking up on. And, you know, actually that kind of makes good sense because during a blizzard, most normal animals are going to hunker down. Deer will find like a deep, uh, you know, tag elder swamp or something and go yard up there in a big group, wait for the blizzard to go over. Well, gee, how convenient. If you know where they're all grouped up together, it sure would make it easy to kill a bunch of them. Yeah, especially in a blizzard with no visibility or... Yeah, and the things can't hear them coming until they're right on top of them. Yeah, exactly. Um, I hate to go back, but I, I when you saw yours, um, did it? Uh, did you get any like uh, facial expressions from it or anything like that? Uh, there was like a split second of surprise, and I'm not quite sure if it realized how I saw it or if it was just surprised that I saw it. But what had happened was is that I had looked back behind me and noticed that something was wrong with what I was seeing. And the, the third time I actually turned and looked back again, I realized what it was is that the trunk of the big pine tree that was off to uh, my rear on my left-hand side, if I turned around, it would have been on my right-hand side. Um, There's this huge pine tree there, and it had three trunks. One had bark on it, two had long gray and white hair on. And, you know, tree trunks don't look like that. So I looked up. And that's when I saw its face up about nine feet, peeking in between the branches, looking at me. And when I looked at it initially, it, it for like a split split instant, maybe it seemed like it registered that, oh, oh, I've been caught. You know, it saw me. 
but it didn't ever look like it was scared or concerned or anything. And the very next thing that it did after that was grin at me. So what do you think that grin's about? Well, it didn't, it didn't infrasound me. It didn't growl at me or anything. Um, at the time, I didn't know what it was. I mean, you know, as a little kid, I could have went, hey, it wants to be my friend. It's, it's grinning at me. Uh, but it was so obviously not a friendly gesture that I took it for actually the way it was intended as a threat jumped on the side and got out of there. Because it turns out all the great apes do that. And you should never smile at one because they think that's a threat. And when they smile at you, it is a threat. What they're doing is they're showing you their teeth and they're saying, hey, this is one of the weapons that I've got to rip you into tiny pieces. Keep your distance. If they ever see one of these guys, don't smile back at one. Yeah, don't smile at them. Looking them directly in the eye is not the best idea either, If you're, especially if you think you might be dealing with the alpha male or a, a troop or something. Um, that's like, you know, saying I'm challenging you for domination of your troop. That's interesting that you said that with, about looking them in the eye, because I've been at uh, a zoo where they had some, just some, you know, even smaller monkeys or whatever, and I did that. I looked one in the eye, and uh, God, he came at me. You know, obviously there was a cage, but, you know, boom, he was there rattling the cage. So, uh yeah, they all sort of uh, have the, the – that's one of the similar behaviors that the, most of them seem to exhibit, too. That if you look them in the eye, it's a challenge. And if you flash a grin at them, that's a, a threat, um, you know. So it, yeah, it's just one of those odd things that seems to run through not just the great apes, but most of the primates, too. So I guess it makes sense that they would uh, do something like that. All right, Duke, so did you have any other um, encounters? Well, I got a or, bunch of uh, different encounters and stories about the Gugwe and the Wendigo, and I'd like to just go over some of the, the basic ones. And some of you folks out there have actually maybe heard uh, one or two of these before. Uh, first off, out of the far north here in the Alaskan, Alaskan district north of Bristol Bay comes the story of Charles J. Dumbleton, sourdough prospector many years in the Yukon and Klondike. After having returned from a season of prospecting 125 miles from the nearest settlement, and wow, that's out in the middle of nowhere, he says the wild man is so feared by those few in the area that they've drawn a voluntary map of the area that they can be safely in. The border to the north they will not cross, and those few who have have never returned. The Terror's Empire is a vast region between the upper south-flowing Mashagak River and the west-flowing middle course, the Cuscoquim. The local trappers draw their border at the King Salmon River. This area on maps, even to this day, is still an unexplored white patch with dotted lines for streams. Another one here from Edward Smith has an article a, entitled Cavemen Roam the Rockies. This came from Winnipeg, Manitoba, Free Press, August 24th, 1940. And it says, men have disappeared in the Rocky Mountains. They have vanished. No trace has ever been found of them again. If marauding animals or savage natives had attacked them, the question of their fate would be easily answered. Therefore, it is asked, were Sasquatches responsible? Only the Rocky Mountains know the answer, and they're short, strict guardians of the secret. Most of the Rockies is still to this day an impenetrable barrier, a mighty unsolved secret. What lies in some of those deep gorges and some of those lonely valleys, awesome abysses, chasms and mist-wrapped peaks, not to speak of the silent depths of the brooding forest between? Will these impenetrable mysteries ever be completely known to men? According to those people who have seen these cavemen, they're enormous, perhaps the twice the size of an average man, and varying in height, from seven to nine feet, each monster having the most terrifying, repulsive, and savage expression. So established now has the fact of their existence become that people are commonly using the word Sasquatch to describe them. Now we got one from the Coleman, Alabama banner of April 16, 1942, the story of a Mrs. George Chapman of Ruby Creek. Well, you probably heard this one before. She reported that a hairy giant 
note the size, 10 feet tall, and having the shape of a man covered with shaggy brown hair, had chased her and her four children from their home in the woods. She said, We fled to the woods and stayed there in the pouring rain for three hours before we dared go back to the house. Unquote. By that time, she said, the giant had gone, leaving his tracks in the soft ground on the bank of the Fraser River and around the woodshed, which was wrecked, apparently in its search for food. These tracks were 16 inches long, 8 inches across the front, and 5 inches across the heel. They brought in a bunch of local uh, woodsmen, experts, white settlers, and Indian leaders who all came to examine the tracks and agreed that these tracks could have been made by a giant bear who came out of the mountains to forage for food and walked entirely on his hind legs. What's wrong with that explanation? That's utter hogwash. Uh, what made him think it was a bear's track? Is it because they couldn't find any front footprints in evidence? Why did they think it was a giant hungry bear that walked exclusively on its hind legs? If its front legs were crippled and it had to walk on its hind legs, then how did it pick up the full drum full of uh, fish, and we're talking barrel here, folks, several hundred pounds, and pick it up, carry it outside of the building, and smash it open? Okay? It had to pick it up somehow. Its front paws weren't working, and it was walking on its hind legs because of them. How did it pick them up? So it was walking on its hind legs, even though its front paws could work. So that doesn't sound too much like a bear to me. Were they seeing claw marks on the tracks? Is that why they thought it might be a bear? A giant bipedal one. Uh, listen, folks, I'd put all my money on a Wendigo being the culprit before I'd think a giant bipedal bear did it. Now, we got another one here. Um, there's a lot of detail elim eliminated from this story because it's just really long. But the interesting part for us is the description of the witness, Riley Smith, of the creature he saw. And Mr. Smith described the man as an awful-looking sort. The wild man was large in stature, its head the most conspicuous part of its body being nearly the size of a horse's head. His teeth resemble those of a horse in size, but are pointed. His hands are extra large. Now, I love that description because that's, if that hadn't been me seeing what I saw, that could have been the same description from somebody else seeing it. From the North Adams, Man, uh, Massachusetts transcript, August 23rd, 1895. From the beautiful land of Kentucky comes the next two sightings. The first from Washington County. Joseph Ewalt claims that the man beast which he saw ran past him, was covered in great long white hair, hanging down from its head and face as well as the rest of it. Now, early Sunday morning, F. Boston and his sons, Tom and James, ran across the same monster in their barn. Quote, even standing half erect, it was six and a half feet tall. Its feet are like the paws of a bear or brute with long claws. His hands also were more like a feline than a human, also equipped with claws. The armed Bostons pursued the creature and vowed it ran swifter than a horse and swiftly left them. This is from the Lincoln, Nebraska Evening News, November 14, 1894. There is another report here from a village named Buena Vista in Girard County. The description of one cited by Jim Peters, a local farmhand, is that, quote, its long hair streamed down its back and breast in a matted mass and covered the face, and its fingers and toenails were long and curved like talons. And that came from the Reno, Nevada Evening Gazette, March 27, 1907. Uh, we also have uh, two interesting reports from Minnesota here. Um, this first one, from the frozen swamps in northern Minnesota comes the next story of the Wendigo, and what was apparently a local pastime around there trying to capture one. According to this story, on at least one occasion, they were successful. This is from the London Times, and yeah, I'm talking about Bat London. January 4th, 1785, a short article on the capture of one 200 miles north of Lake of the Woods, and that it had arrived in France for exhibition. The creature was seven feet tall, and when the party of Indians who captured it attested that when it was caught, 
there was half a bear found lying beside it, which it had just killed. A gentleman named Robert Lincoln, an agent of the New York Western Lumber Company, about January 14, 1839, had a report from his men having seen a huge monster in the forest on the branch of the Mississippi River. He immediately set his native hunters the task of capturing it. By January 21st, they had located the general area where the creature was lurking, and Mr. Lincoln and many well-armed men set about pursuing it. <clears throat> now, I should mention at this point that Mr. Lincoln was there to set up a lumber mill. They owned the entire area. They had bought it. They were going to set up a lumber mill there. They were going to have all of the, the workers that it took to build the lumber mill and the lumbermen actually cutting down the trees and supplying the lumber to make the lumber mill with and the natives to run around and do all the hunting for him. So this guy had a lot of people there with him, very rugged, tough people that were pretty well damn armed. So when it came about that the, the natives showed up and said, hey, boss, there's a monster out there around the woods. Uh, we may have some trouble with it. He went, hmm, perhaps we should go capture it. We have nothing better to do. Go find it. So after a week of out there looking around for it, it was uh, it was spotted, and they gave chase to it. And, of course, when they did spot it, it let out a fearful shriek, which echoed through the forest, and it fled. The pursuit lasted over an hour, and it ended when it was chased out onto a prairie, whereupon it turned and charged the group following it. Mr. Lincoln, fearing for his own men's safety, but having ordered them to take it alive, took it upon himself to fire a load of buckshot, and we're talking like double lot buckshot here, folks, into the creature's thigh, knocking it down. At this point, the natives swarmed the beast, and after a fearsome struggle, bound it with ropes, spilt a litter, and carried it back to camp. Well, the thing here is that this thing, uh, if you had shot an average human in the leg at close range with double lot, you would have blown his leg off. So even though it didn't blow the uh, creature's leg off, it probably incapacitated him pretty well, which, you know, you figure uh, a dozen or so uh, natives and assorted other people of real tough guys diving on him and trying to bind him with ropes and stuff at, at that point, you can imagine how it could have possibly been successful. So when they finally did get him all captured and bound, here is what they said he looked like. Quote, he is a horrid looking creature, about eight foot three high, when standing erect and his frame is of giant proportions in every part. His legs are not straight, but like those of any four footed animal and his whole body was covered by a hide, very much like that of a cow. His arms are very large and long and ill-proportioned. It does not appear from his manner that he ever walked on all fours. The fingers and toes are all bunches, armed with stout claws. His head is covered with thick, coarse black hair, like the mane of a horse. The appearance of his countenance, if such it may be called, is very disgusting, nay, almost horrible. It is covered with a lighter, thinner coat than the rest of the body, there is appearance of eyebrows or nose. The mouth is very large and wide and similar to that of a baboon. His eyes are quite dull and heavy. Mr. Lincoln says he is beyond doubt carnivorous as he universally rejected bread and vegetables and, on the other hand, ate flesh with great avidity. Did these frontiersmen actually capture not a wendigo but a gugly? And if so, do these monsters still walk and lurk in the swamps and lonely forests of Minnesota? Well, we're going to have to send Grant out there to find out about it, I guess. There's just no other way around it. <laughs> All right. Sign me up. Sign me up. You know what happens. Give, give him the flamethrower and the uh, powered armor, and he'll, he'll be ready to go. Here I got another one from the... Uh, Oconee County, South Carolina, according to the Dunkirk, New York Observer Journal, July 16, 1889, quote, During the time the Indians were in the South, a hunting party had established a camp on the east of the Tubelo River. Though they brought deer back to camp, something would steal them during the day when they went out hunting. Finally, they decided to hide near the camp and watch the thief. Imagine their surprise. When the thief turned out to be, quote, a monster, hairy all over at seven foot tall, and walking elect like, erect like a man, its mouth was in its chin, and it had great claws on its fingers and toes. 
Now, apes have a longer distance between their nose and their upper lip than humans do. Is this what the natives meant when they said its mouth was in its chin? Again, note the very un-Bigfoot-like description of claws. So anyway, the story says that one native fired a musket ball into the creature's back, whereupon it dropped the deer, turned, and charged them. A volley of six more rounds from the remaining braves were poured into the brute's chest, whereupon it finally dropped in its tracks. So are are they friendly? Uh, no. Now here's another account that a bunch of you, you folks may have heard before. Uh, an account of a wild man report that came in from Idaho, not too far from where I am. And in the light of all the facts given in the story, should be reinterpreted, I believe, a lot differently. This one was attributed to a Bigfoot, but I think it was probably a mountain giant. Now, we're going to not talk about mountain giants in this episode, but I am going to mention this one report because this is another example of how Bigfoot sort of gets blamed for everything, including things that maybe Bigfoot didn't do, um, <clears throat> that some of his relatives may have been the culprits. This story comes from the Dubuque Telegram Herald Wednesday January 29th, 1902, mentions that the little town of Chesterfield, in an isolated area of Bannock County, Idaho, people had been encountering an eight-foot-tall hair-covered monster who gave them quite the fright. On January 14th, middle of the damn winter again, the monster appeared to a group of youngsters who were skating on the river, whether in an area shoveled clear of snow or if, in fact, the entire river was clear of it, is not told. What is reported is that the creature was acting aggressively, brandishing a large club, and uttering a series of yells that started to attack the skaters, who, owing to having their skates on, of course, used them to dart to their wagons and get safely away. Now, Bigfoot are not known to be aggressive as a rule. They're not known to go after a group of humans, and even more unusual, not to mention wielding a large club as a weapon. None of this behavior fits in with the reports of behavior of other Bigfoot sightings from all over the place. But all of this fits with the violent behavior and tool use described in mountain giant reports. So what to make of this beast's eight foot height then? Well, considering that a youngster of that species would be about that height and still green enough to think it could catch skating humans in a group and get away with it, a task at which it obviously failed miserably. <clears throat> the story then goes on to relate that upon their return to the area, tracks were found. These tracks were 22 inches long and had four toes. Ha ha! Mountain giant tracks have four toes. Now wait a minute. They said the thing they saw was eight foot tall. Now can you picture a creature that's eight foot tall with feet two feet long? That's the hominid equivalent of a snowshoe rabbit. Now try drawing a picture of that and see how silly it looks. But wait, now what if those tracks were not found at the sighting spot? They weren't. Those tracks were actu actually rather found along the range to the west of the river. My guess is that when Junior broke the rules and chased the humans, whether from anger or for fun, it was Mama who heard the ruckus he was making, knew what the humans would likely do, and came up and drug Junior away, leaving behind her very obvious and enormous sport of tracks for the humans to discover at some point in the future. So sometimes you need to look into these accounts a little bit more carefully before you can really be sure of what it is that you're looking at. Here's another one that uh, is an older historical account. This is comes from the St. Louis Dispatch. A strange visaged creature, apparently one of nature's prodigies, has just been discovered near Meadville, Franklin County, Mississippi causing much excitement in that usually monotonous village. A letter from a friend residing in that village dated June the 2nd says, At this time, it is very much agitated on account of the strange creature seen near here. It is said to be similar to the one seen near Vicksburg last fall. A Vicksburg paper of a date some few days subsequent to the discovery of this strange creature near that place gave a full description of it and the manner in which it was discovered, which, given from memory, is in substance about as follows. Sometime in September last, as a party of huntsmen were driving in the swamp some few hours from the river, a trail was broken by the hounds, 
and followed up at a brisk pace, leaving the party far behind. In following the dogs, they discovered the track of the game in some miry places, which appeared similar to the track of a human foot, and they observed also that the toes on one foot turned backward. On coming up with the dogs, which were now being, they beheld a frightful-looking creature of about the average height of a man, but with far greater muscular development, standing menacingly a few yards in front of the dogs. It had long, coarse hair flowing from its head and reaching near its knees. Its entire body also seemed to be covered with hair of two to three inches in length, which was of a dark brown color. From its upper jaw projected two very large tusks several inches long. Its head and face, as well, could be determined from the distance of the observers or a striking resemblance to that of the Negro, except that the chin and the cheeks were covered with long hair. On the near approach of the hunters, it fled with great rapidity toward the Mississippi River and was not overtaken again until within a few yards of the bank. When the party came up with the dogs the second time, the monster was standing erect before them, none of them having yet dared to clinch with it. But when the dogs were urged by their masters, they endeavored to seize it. When it reached forward and grabbed one of them, and taking it in its hands, pressed it against its tusks, which pierced it through and killed the dog instantly. Becoming alarmed at this display of strength, the hunters fired several shots at the creature, which caused it to leap into the river. It remained underwater several minutes and then rose almost the entire length above the surface, uttering shrieks which almost petrified the pursuers of terror. No similar sounds had ever come to these men, who were all familiar with the howl of the wolf, the whine of the panther, and the hoarse bellowing of the alligator. After sinking and rising several times, it swam to the Louisiana shore and disappeared from sight forever. Now in Cracker's Neck, Virginia, in the early 1800s, or maybe even the late 1700s, Joe Ash Cracker was out trapping for the season with his son. No one around, so they didn't lock the cabin since there was no one to steal from them there. Then one day they returned, <coughs> excuse me, one day in the fall, they returned to the cabin to find it ransacked and their food missing. Concluding a bear must have done it, they resolved to only have one of them leave at a time. The other stay at the cabin or guard. The other stay at the cabin on guard. Then one day his son returned to find his father very alarmed. Some strange creature had been making mournful cries about the cabin. After this, they again resolved to stay together, and this they did, piling up many furs until late in the winter when they began to pack everything up in preparation to leave the cabin. The son went out and shot a number of squirrels early in the day for their lunch while his father remained at the cabin to finish packing. But upon his return, young Cracker beheld a scene that chilled him to, the bo to his bones and made his eyes bulge in horror and the hair on his neck stand up. Just exiting the cabin as he came up was a monster drawn from the heart of a nightmare itself. Young Cracker's heart raced as his eyes beheld this unknown thing. It was much taller than any man and had a thick chest and massive muscles on its upright bipedal frame. The thing was entirely covered in hair and had no clothing. It was pacing, excuse me, racing toward the tree line away from the cabin. In one of its massive hands at the end of its unnaturally long arm, it held a round object in stark terror. Young Cracker dropped to a knee and took careful aim at the fleeing monster with his musket. He finally realized that what it held in his hand was his father's severed head. He knew he had but one chance to avenge his father, for if he missed the fiendish brute would be long gone by the time he could reload. Fighting back tears and sobbing, he took careful aim and exhaled, then squeezed the trigger. The flint sent a shower of sparks into the pan, propelling a flash and sulfurous cloud of smoke up to obscure his sight of the thing. But a split instant later, the main charge lit and a cannon-like boom echoed off the trees around him. He lowered the barrel as the murderous beast took a nosedive and ate dirt. Young Cracker ran toward it and along the way found one of his father's legs apparently torn off at the hip by inhuman strength of his merciless attacker. He found the torso of his father further on and saw how the head and neck had been torn from it with sheer massive strength and the lethal fury of his savage head-hunting attacker. The neck had also been removed in the attack. He dug a grave near the cabin and placed his father's remains in it. After this, 
he drug the body of the monster into a nearby hole and buried it as well, pretty much where it had fallen on its face. The lad spent the rest of the time preparing to leave the area the following morning. However, that night, he could hear inhuman shrieks and wails shattering the silence and near the cabin over and over and over again all night until sunrise. After the longest night of his young life Cracker could ever remember spending, it was light again, and the noise stopped. Daring to go out, he found the grave of the creature was open and empty. There were many footprints of enormous size around it. Taking only what he could carry with him, and his father and his own musket, he departed forthwith, never to return to the area again. Here's another one that you might not want to listen to on a dark, spooky night in a cabin out in the middle of nowhere by yourself. These report details uh, came from trapper Howard B. LeBlanc, a 54-year-old trapper and hunting guide from Kenora, Ontario. The tale was told to Howard when he was a boy by his father, a French-Canadian fur trapper, from when he worked the area northeast of Huntsville, Ontario, as a boy before Algonquin Park was a managed area. At that time, the lumber trade was very active in the area, leading to an influx of hunters and fishermen who used the logging roads to gain greater access to the deep wilderness areas. A father and son from Chicago, Illinois, by the family name of Sears, on a hunting trip for moose in the greater Mattawa River region, guided by an Algonquin Indian French-Canadian guide, Little Jack more than likely his nickname. The guide Little Jack was a guide of some reputation in the region who was known for putting hunters onto large moose, and so, of course, was much sought after. Having made a name for himself guiding rich tourists and visiting politicians from across Canada and the U.S. The year was 1894. The exact location was a lake named with Elm. The season was October, rutting season for the moose, the best time to hunt bull moose, which congregated at that time of the year to battle for dominance in the mating season. The hunters and guide paddled the main trunk of the Mattawa River along the Ontario-Quebec border. Taking a branch creek north into Quebec, on this two-day trip, many moose were seen, but the Sears were looking for a true trophy and pressed Little Jack to take them deeper and still deeper into the wild region. With some hesitation, Little Jack agreed to take them to a lake he knew of, but explained to them that they would stay only in that area during daylight hours and would be departing by midday, as he had fears of some large beast that was reputed to frequent the area. The Sears took as superstition and largely discounted Little Jack's warnings. On arriving at the lake, Little Jack laid down the ground rules for the day's hunt. He instructed the Sears to stay on the south side of the lake only, and placed the father in a thicket overlooking a clearing that was bordered by the lake. The son was to canoe along the lake to the east and set up his hunting blind along a marsh area. Both men promised they would not cross the lake, which was not wide at that point, and the guide would go between the two men frequently. Little Jack was very nervous and spent a great deal of time that morning being sure his charges were staying in their assigned hunting spots. Now, at about noon, Little Jack told Mr. Sears Sr. to begin to get ready to leave uh promising to bring them back early the next morning. Then began to turn to leave, but Mr. Sears Sr. then pointed out to the lake. Little Jack turned to see young Mr. Sears paddling across the lake already very close to the other side. Little Jack began to run yelling and waving, trying to get young Mr. Sears to turn around, but the young man either did not hear him or simply chose to ignore him. It was at this time that Mr. Sears Sr. noticed a large shape moving in the tree line along the shore of the opposite side of the lake. Thinking it was a moose, he called out to Little Jack, who at this point was about to land his canoe. Little Jack was frantic and turned to tell Mr. Sears Sr. to remain silent. Getting into the canoe, Little Jack began to paddle as quickly as possible, but by this time, young Mr. Sears was already landing and pulling his canoe up onto the opposing shoreline. Little Jack again tried to call young Mr. Sears back, but the young man ignored his calls and walked into the woods. In the time it took for Little Jack to cross the lake, he heard the reports of young Mr. Sears' rifle as several shots were fired, followed by silence for a moment. As Little Jack was about to land his canoe, young Mr. Sears came running out of the tree line as if being pursued. Little Jack had no time to land his canoe, but raised his own rifle, firing to shoot whatever might be chasing young Mr. Sears. A large, upright, hair-covered beast that emerged from the tree line after young Mr. Sears. In a few short steps, 
The beast was upon young Mr. Sears, and the beast reportedly decapitated the young man by grabbing him by the upper torso from behind, and then with his other hand simply twisted the young man's head off. Little Jack emptied his gun at the beast in horror, but the beast did not fall. Instead, it carried the body of young Mr. Sears back into the woods, dragging the body by a leg and carrying the young man's head in his other hand. Little Jack, having no more ammunition, returned to Mr. Sears Sr. It is reported that Mr. Sears Sr. insisted on going after the beast, having witnessed the entire event from his vantage point on the opposing side of the lake. But Little Jack refused and almost had to drag the distraught father away from the area. When having reached their camp at the Mattawa River, Little Jack insisted they pack and paddle of the nearest settlement, which they reached by the following morning. It was reported to a local constable who led a search party that included both Little Jack and Mr. Sears Sr. and several loggers and woodsmen to the lake, where they searched for several days, finding only young Mr. Sears' broken rifle and a short trail of blood at the actual area of death of young Mr. Sears. It is reported that the searchers all heard beastly screams and howls on those nights when the search would be suspended due to the coming of darkness. And eventually, they all gave up in fear, as each night the screams and howls seemed to be closer to their camp. In the aftermath, Little Jack moved to the Huntsville area. After that trip, his reputation was ruined. He made his living trapping and fishing and was said to have become an alcoholic drinking away his money when he had any, and living off land, but never, never too far from town. So the Wendigo is not a pleasant fellow. Now, some of you may have heard of the uh, the Beast of Seven Shoots up in Canada. It's one of the more famous pictures circulating around, and there's been a bunch of debate about whether it's a picture of a dog man, a dog man or if it's the person who snapped the picture shot a whole uh, a number of my I, if I remember right, it was something like 110, 111 shots. And he was just kind of randomly walking around taking pictures of everything. When he shot the picture of the creature of seven shoots, he did not see it in the picture. He was just shooting a random picture of an area and continued walking. Really what he was doing is he was walking over, from what I understand, was like an old abandoned train trestle. And he, he took a shot off one side, and then he took a shot off the other side. And when he got back home and looked at him, he saw the shot off the right-hand side showed some sort of thing standing down in the bushes looking up at him. Underneath its arms, it held something white. Well, interestingly enough, someone that I know actually had to investigate a missing dog from the park right next to it the same day that this happened. And the dog was reported missing shortly before this picture was taken. The person who did the investigation talked to the family that lost the dog. This was a full-size poodle. And as you folks know, a full-size poodle is a good-sized dog. It's not one of those itty-bitty little, you know, toy poodles or teacup poodles or slingshot-powered poodles or whatever. Not one of those teeny tiny little things, a regular full-size dog. <clears throat> the thing that took the dog they had seen take the dog. It picked the dog up, it killed it, put it under its arm, walked off with it. Um, it had a, a face that had a snout on it, but was otherwise built like a Bigfoot. Did not have dog legs. Da 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 da. It was a gugly. So let the mythology of is that a dog man be dispelled once and for over, forever. That's an excellent picture of a gugly, is what it is. And uh, when we put up this episode, we'll make sure to. Uh, include some pictures for you guys to look at. Now, the last one that I have here before I go to answering questions from Grant is just a short one, um, just to let you guys know that uh, by no means are we safe down here in the lower 48. This uh, very interesting Gugwe sighting comes from Pennsylvania, south of Penfield, Pennsylvania. A man who was out walking his dogs on leashes at about 10.30 a.m. in the morning, September 11th, 2014, was walking the dogs on state game land when ahead of them, an enormous creature stepped out of the brush. His dogs went absolutely crazy, barking at the thing in obvious anger and were doing their utmost to break loose of their leashes. Fortunately for them, the straps and their owner held on. The creature was taking long strides as it moved, but seemed to be in no hurry. 
In fact, it had sure hair or fur, which was dark in color. It stood eight to ten feet tall. He thought it might have been a Bigfoot, but he said it had a prominent snout on it like a dog does. It stopped for a moment, noticing the barking and, you know, going, dogs going wild and barking and complete uh, craziness. Uh, and according to the man, he just had a calm look on his face. He just stopped for a moment, calmly gazed at the dogs and the witness, and then unhurriedly continued walking and finally disappeared again into the depths of the forest on the other side. <clears throat> so, folks, that was only in 2014, and it was in Pennsylvania. So just because you're in the lower 48, just because it's daytime, it's another bad sign right there, it's daytime, These uh, the more aggressive ones don't seem like they really care a whole lot if you see them. And if you do see them, it may be because they're letting you see them because they're planning on killing you anyway. So it's best if you ever see one of these things to go in the opposite direction at a, a brisk pace. And I do not advocate running from them. They are predators and will more than likely pre uh, trigger a chase response from them, which could end up ending very, very badly for you. So leave the area. Do not run. Um, if at all possible, don't turn your back entirely on them. Uh, that's also a bad plan. You're just asking for it. But that's it for the, uh, the, the reports and the stories that I've got that I thought you guys might be interested in hearing. I just figured I would catch you guys all up on what is a Gugwe, what is a Wendigo, what is Janosqua, what's the difference between them, um, how are they different than Bigfoot. So, Grant, do you have any questions that you think I should uh, cover? I guess I just wanted to take a moment to um, thank everybody for um, watching or listening to our show and all of our subscribers that we have on YouTube. Um, so, and if you're not a subscriber, if you would subscribe to our channel, me and Duke would uh, definitely appreciate that. And also, I just wanted to let people know um, if you've had an encounter, um, and you'd like to tell myself or Duke about it, um, just send us an email. Yeah, that's I'd like to uh, concur with what Grant just said there, too. Thanks a lot for listening to our show, folks. And uh, If you subscribe, it really helps us out. So we we would really appreciate that. Clicking like um, is, is nice, too. We like that. But uh, <laughs> we're just hoping to keep uh, bringing more of the same uh, kind of interesting quality program that we, we hope you think we've been bringing to you so far and uh, just double down on it, uh, hopefully keep the, uh, the quality up there nice and high and uh, uh, the cost to you down to nothing, it's zero. As long as you guys go and subscribe to our channel, we're gonna be able to keep it at zero. Uh, you know, we don't get paid to do any of this. And uh, so <clears throat> what any help that we can get is, well, very helpful. <laughs> and we really